tilt is because we landed on a slope. The landing gear struts appear to be about evenly depressed. Okay, Al, beautiful. I can see you on the surface. Not bad for an old man. I can't imagine having a more remarkable experience. Our next guest is as certain as a man can be that we really landed on the moon. He was on the committee that selected that exact landing spot you saw in that movie. We're very fortunate to have Dr. Farouk El Baz. He is a research professor and director of the Center for Remote Sensing at Boston University. What was it like when you're, where were you when they actually set that foot down on the moon's surface? At the Mission Control Center in Houston, Texas. Now, when you see that happen, what's happening inside for you? Well, the very first time, it was uh, the, the nerves were as tight together as you possibly can get. Because you don't know, that thing could sit down on the top of the dust and then just keep going. You didn't know, right? Or on a hill and rolls down. Or on a, when one, one leg would be over one great big block and it would fall over. And that would be, a lot of it would be your fault. The real disaster, because these are guys that we know and it will be, yes, our fault because we selected the place and we said it is safe, it is level. And at level, it had to be really level. It, it could not have been 13 degrees, because if it is 13 degrees or more, the spacecraft would topple over, and the mission would be gone. So it had to be level, and we had to uh, assure everybody that's actually level, even though we did not have topographic maps, and we did not know how level is level. So we assumed from the shadows and all of that what, what level ground should look like, and all of that was interpretation by uh, the, in, the uh, experience of Earth geology because we've never been to the moon to study it first. So we had to assume all of the, of the surface features from our own experience of the, of the geology of the Earth. And when they touch down at this moment, we're, we're now taking a look at, I understand they only had 30 seconds left That's of right. fuel. That's right. So you're the, we're on the committee, you're the secretary of the committee yes. that picked this landing spot. Yep. And they, they kind of overshoot the landing spot, right? That is right. And you, for something that you've got to be sweating bullets. <laughs> yes, we were, <laughs> because they 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 did not land anywhere near where we suggested, because there was something in the moon that we did not take into account because we never knew that it was there. What you see, all of these dark places on the moon. You look at the moon and mm -hmm. see the uh, face of the man in the moon. All of the dark spots are made of rock that is heavier than the rock around it. So as the spacecraft moves over these, they, it, the spacecraft is pulled towards these rock, the, towards these areas, a little down, a little further down, and therefore it speeds up so it goes farther than where it is supposed to be. They are, there are anomalies in its path. As That's it correct. We call, we call them mass concentrations. They became known later as, as mass cons. So that was this incredible experience. And the thing that you're working on now, I just, I, when we went to break, I asked him, what, what does he do when he goes to work every day? You look at cool pictures from outer space. Yes. Tell me about this Center for Remote Sensing. At uh, Boston University, we uh, em emphasize use of satellite images in fields like archaeology, geology, and geography. So we make maps of the, the terrain. We look at the structure of the Earth, and we see, look at the environment. What actually controls the environment? When we look at a desert area, we see, all right, this is the desert. Was it a desert before, or was it not? And what happened? How did it change, and how, how did it change with time? So we look at a forest and we say, all right, what is, was that forest exactly the same this way all of the time, or has it changed? So right now we're looking at a picture of the Arabian Peninsula. One of the things I read about you, the Apollo-Soyuz mission resulted in the most comprehensive set of photos of the world's deserts yes. ever taken. What did we learn about from pictures like this? The, the deserts that we see today were not deserts before. They, they hosted a great deal of rain, and they're very different kinds of climates. And as the climate changed drastically, then the wind took over and shaped them into the, these uh, dunes that we see today. So uh, let's go to the next picture. I know we have one that shows this uh, amazing photo oh, yes. of uh, sand dunes. Yeah, this one is in they, Egypt. They talk about the desertification that, that is happening in that part of the world. Is that something we should be a little worried about? Well, the change in the desert boundaries, we really shouldn't call it desertification. It is the, uh, the edge between the desert and the, uh, the wetlands 
moves back and forth with time with major changes in the, in, in the, uh, uh, the, in the climate of the earth. That's, that's part of the natural, that's happening even before man is there and having engines and factories and pollution, right? That's correct. That just happens. That's correct. And it still happens today too. So uh, should we be worried that it's going to happen more, or do we just have to go, hey, you got to take the good with the bad? No, we have to learn how to live with it. On the years when there is a lot of rain, yes, we can use the rain fall for agriculture and raising crops and, all, and cattle and all of that. And when the, the, during the, the years of, uh, of uh, drought, you can use the groundwater and the vice versa and so on. Should we, should we pay attention? Remember the great comic, Sam Kennison, who used to do that sort of cruel natured thing about, you know what the problem is with all the people over there in Eritrea, they, they don't have any food. Yeah. It's the desert. There's no food there. Yeah. Move to where the food is. Yeah. Should we use information like this to help people resettle? Should we say, move to where the food is? It is really not moving where the food is, but learning how to live within that kind of environment. It is, it is quite possible that you be able to modify your lifestyle at times. That's why, for instance, nomadism began. You move to an area where you have uh, agriculture like that. Now, t we're looking at this shot now that is farming from groundwater, that surrounded right. by desert. That is right. Where is this from? This particular area is in the southern part of the United Arab Emirates where they're very close to mountain range, it rains on the mountains, and the water goes from the mountains to the lowlands, accumulates into groundwater, and you can drill there and pipe it and have this kind of magnificent uh, uh, agriculture in the desert. Is it sustainable? It is sustainable for All a very long period of time. Uh, let's go to the, uh, there's this amazing shot that seems to show an underground river. Can we go yeah. to that shot? I'd like to, to know more about this. This was taken from, tell me about where this shot was taken from. This uh, is not really like a regular photograph. It is mm -hmm. a radar image where this, the, from the shuttle. The shuttle emits radar waves, and the radar waves are reflected back, and the shuttle instrument actually measures the echo that comes back from the radar. Uh, so, and therefore, if, the, if there is very solid rock, the radar echo is hard, and you see very white uh, area in the, in the picture. If the uh, land is surface is quite smooth, then the radar reflection is, is, is not very tough, and therefore you see kind of a, a, a gentle gray area. That's the dark areas that you were mentioning. Yeah. But you can see, basically, with radar, you can see underground water that a guy walking out there just thinks this is nothing but sand here. That is what we realized unknowingly. This was during a mission when we really didn't know that this is going to happen. And there was the radar instrument from a friend of mine from JPL who designed it, and they told them to take a, a strip over the western desert in Egypt of the area that I'm working in. And he said, tell me about it. I said, well, it's a plan area with, with a lot of sand. He said, well, this will be a waste of film. Well, you, you know radar needs some rock to reflect back. So I said, but we really need it if we can get some, any of the fractures or anything like that. And he ran it, and it turned out to be the most significant thing in the mission because the radar waves penetrated through the sand completely, as if it doesn't exist, because it is dry and fine-grained, and then became reflected from the first solid rock layer beneath the sand. And that first uh, solid rock layer beneath the sand had the imprint of former rivers, had the courses of former rivers there. Wow. And we went, yeah. Bobby from Roxbury is on the phone. Bobby, your chance to ask a question of a real rocket scientist type. Go ahead. Yes. Um the, the, doesn't it seem um, to you, sir, that if we could actually put a lot more money uh, into um, space research, and uh, not even just applied research, but just just um, just just the basic discovery, uh, the basic avenue of just just seeking, uh, that we could have even even over over and above just what we dream of, we never even really know. Um, and throughout history, this is always val validated. Just any way you look, we never know exactly where it's going to end up. But it truly, uh, there are untold. Um, just untold advances and progress that can be used to, in terms of enhancing our quality of life and, and even just above the applied aspect of it. Uh, that's always been our fundamental quest to, to seek and to know. And it's just a shame that we have to have some type of military competition or something like that as we did during the Cold War well, to, it, to fuel people and to get people behind that. Wasn't it interesting to hear that uh, the story you were just telling us about finding this underground old river 
was an accident. Absolutely, we did know, not know about it. And, and the, the gentleman is certainly true, or is certainly right. That when you do uh, scientific exploration and when you investigate into the sciences within a controlled environment and you know what you're doing and you're investigating, investigating, you collect information, you learn a great deal. So one of the things that people should say when they say, why should we keep the space program? What are you going to find out about? Yeah. The answer is, we don't know yet. It could it, be really great. In some ways, you, we don't know yet, but we know for sure that all of the things that happened in the space program had benefits towards uh, for us. So the, the communication satellite, the, the things that happened in the medical, medical uh, uh, community, all of this kind of stuff what came from the space research. I can roam on my cell phone, thanks to you guys. Thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> if you've got a question about the space program, when do you ever get the chance to uh, ask people like this your own questions? Log on to our website at cn8.tv slash nightbeat and click on the email the show icon or call in your comments at 1-800-755-5600. That's 1-800-755-5690. We'll be back with more cool stuff. Invaders to Mars were launched this summer from Kennedy Space Center. Two small rovers that, if all goes well, will be landing on Mars just after the new year. Here to help us understand what benefits the Earth might receive from a planetary exploration program, still with us, Farouk El Baz, research professor and director of the Center for Remote Sensing at Boston University. And joining us now, David Aguilar, director of public affairs for the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Welcome. I'm glad to be here. That must sound. That must feel so great when people say, uh, what do you do? Instead of saying, uh, I'm a CPA, you say, I'm with the Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. I know, but it's a name about that long. Yes, it takes a while to get it out. So tell me, this is, uh, what is this thing we're looking at right here? This is so cool. This is Sojourner. This went to Mars in 97. This is a model of the this one. It's a model of the one that went there, but you can see how small it is. It looks like something that could scoot around in your bedroom and down the hallways. It's not big and massive like the, the Viking landers that went in 1976. Those things were the size of automobiles. So with the technology and our capabilities to miniaturize, this is what we're sending now to the to Mars and to other This planets. is the whole kit and caboodle. This is the whole, well, this came out. It came out of a lander that bounced in a big balloon five times about 50 feet into the air, and then it finally calmed down, and then it opened up, and this came out of it. Now, when, they, when the new ones that just were sent, what are their names? Uh, there's, there's four of them. There are two of them are European space agencies, and, and the two of the NASA ones, uh, the name is slipped. Yeah, Mars, uh, Opportunity the Mar and Mars Spirit. Opportunity and Spirit. MER, yeah. the, the Mars MER. Exploration yeah. Rover. Now, what do they hope to do up there? Because, you know, we, once upon a time, we hoped we'd find little green people or something, or yeah. canals. Yeah. We know they're not, th that's not there now. What do we hope to find up on Mars? Leftover from green little things, not no longer oh, green. Okay. <laughs> so they were really looking for two things, Some, something about the chemistry of the Martian soil and the potential remains of potential uh, microbial uh, remains. In addition to the fact that uh, if there was any water in the Martian environment at times past, then the results of that water in its reaction with the soil would still be present. So You'd see oxidized water, things, yes. right? Yes. Like rust, the yes. equivalent of rust. Like iron that oxidizes. Well, Mars rust. is rusted, that's why it's red. So now, what are the, uh, the, the places that the uh, rovers are going to these, these new expeditions? Where there are, are two come? places. One in the, bo both of them are kind of equatorial, near the equator. One of them is just a very flat area in the middle of, the, uh, of a very flat terrain that looks as if it was an ending of a large uh, flood plain. And then another is the center of a crater. That where there is actually a little meandering channel that leads into that crater. So if there was a, a river that meandered into this channel, then you will be, see the leftovers from that river within that crater. What about the, the ice caps? Are, uh, isn't there a, an expedition to go someplace and try and find a little bit of that ice? Yeah, the Europeans are going towards the ice caps. The ice caps are tantalizing because they come and go. The southern ice cap is receding very quickly. We see on a weekly basis, as we've been viewing it now since Mars is so close, you can see it disappearing. That's the carbon dioxide leaving. The ice in the water remains behind, but there's not that much of it. So it's really when we see the ice caps build and grow. It's the carbon dioxide freezing and, and now 
uh, dissipating into the atmosphere, but there's water there. What would it take to find, unless Mars was made of gold, yeah. I don't think we're going to go anytime soon. What would it take for there to be, as far as a discovery on Mars, for it to regenerate the interest in interplanetary travel? Biological remains, evidence of life that once lived on Mars, even if it was microbial, even if it's very tiny, then it's proof that actually life exists beyond Earth, because we've never proved that. Right now on the phone from Loudon, New Hampshire, Bob. Welcome, Bob. You're welcome. Thank you. Join in. Uh, you had a gentleman on a, li a little bit before these folks uh, who is a disbeliever in the fact that uh, we ever went uh, to the moon mm -hmm. and landed there. And I have a very old friend of mine, a fellow by the name of Dick Nadel, who uh, lives in Dix Hills, uh, New York, on Long Island, uh, a communications engineer and... Uh, he actually, in 69, assembled his own dish and a bunch of equipment, um, a, a good deal of it that he had borrowed from where he worked at the time, uh, to, and, and was able to receive the communications from the moon uh, himself. He was not, you know, was not a governmental agency or anything. Uh, so a civilian can tell you that they went. They were there talking. He, yes, his antenna was pointed at the moon. This was where the signals were coming from. Uh, and uh, he had contacted NASA, who didn't believe that he could have received it because they used to use these monster antennas and Goldstone and so forth. Uh, and uh, so, he ultimately sent them a copy of what he had received, and they eventually verified that, yes, he Bob had Bob has two, uh, two good points. One... They really went to the moon, and two, NASA should buy more stuff from Radio Shack, right? <laughs> that's right. Now, that's, uh, this story is, is really very interesting because of the fact that in, uh, during the Apollo uh, program, after the astronauts came back, we used to sit down with them for a debriefing session. And these debriefing sessions took we uh, at least two weeks. It's very interesting that during the debriefing of the Apollo 15 mission, I was leaving the room of the debriefing with uh, the commander of the Apollo 15 mission, uh, David Scott, and uh, it was a, a very beautiful night. The moon was shining in the sky, and he put his hand on my shoulder and said, you know, Farouk, I swear to God, I don't believe I was there. Why? Because it is such a, a, a journey beyond the imagination of normal people. So, it is, uh, so if, if even the astronaut, the, the commander of the mission himself, looks at the moon and says, my God, was I there? He, if he himself thinks this way, then it's okay for some people to you say You can it. understand that yes. people would have it. <laughs> what do the people over at your office think? Will people one day, however distant in the future, walk on Mars? Absolutely. We have no choice. First of all, we're overpopulating this planet. We're going to have to go somewhere. We're going to have to look for new materials. And it's in our genetic code. It's our makeup. That's what human beings do. We reach out into other environments. We extend ourselves into places we never should be able to survive, and we do. It's part of who we are and what makes us very special on this planet. But Mars makes the crummiest places on, the, on this planet look like a great place to live, by but comparison. It tantalizes us. It yes, it does. It has water, it has an atmosphere, and it's one of the closest objects next door. Nothing ever happens on the moon. The moon just sits there. It's done. Maybe a wall crumbles, but Mars, it has clouds, it has weather, it has wind, it has storms. It tantalizes us. So the moon is, is old news. The moon is toast as far as exploration. Uh, the, the moon can be used to get to Mars. What, what about the, the space station that's out there now? There's a, there's a lot of controversy over, yeah, it was such a compromise that it got compromised into being next You're to You're asking an astronomer. Uh, you can, I'm <laughs> sorry, tell you, you to drop it <laughs> from the sky. <laughs> Just tell, show me what it's doing and why we need it, and I'm with you. <laughs> right now, Mike from Guilford, Connecticut's on the phone. Welcome, Mike. Hey, thank you uh, for taking my call. Sure, jump in. Um, not really um, trying to contravene exactly what you're trying to do with uh, going to Mars. I'm definitely for it. Um, but I have a question uh, for both your panelists. Sure. Um, where um, are they advancing the technology in order to uh, uh, create a single stage orbiter to go from Earth into orbit for so much cheaper? and then apply that exact same technology, go from orbit to either Mars or orbit to the moon. Mike brings up the interesting design problem. Sure. Uh, 
The Pass fuel, the shuttle. The what fuel do you requirement. Do? The fuel requirement is, is vast. It would be enormous. Yes, you can make that when you are in Earth orbit in space. You certainly can do that very simply and very easily. And we thought at the time, way back, that most scientists, as he said, would, we wouldn't see a real use for the space station unless it does that. And because if, if the space station is used as a launching pad for missions to the planets or to outer space, that would be great. And it could do that, and we could use what he's suggesting. But a, a single stage uh, 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 rocket from Earth to, be, to the Earth orbit or beyond would be the fuel requirements would be just absolutely fast. And, and there's better ways to do it. It's much easier just to put something in orbit around the Earth and Mars that just maintains that orbit. And you just latch onto it as if you're taking a little express train. You get on board when it comes past the Earth. You live on it. It's going to take you 9 to 10, 11 months to get to Mars. You live in this. They call it the Mars Hotel. You get to Mars. You jump off with your shuttle. You come down to the surface. You wait till the next one comes by to come home. It's a much simpler, so easier you're way to do it. you're talking about... Uh, eventually there would be a sort of giant space station that rotated around the, an orbit around the Earth yeah. and Mars. Or two of them that rotate like two big wheels joined in the center so that there's gravity. One of the biggest problems we have living in space and surviving is the gravity. It affects the human body in ways that is very difficult for us to counteract. So this thing has gravity and you just get on the Mars Hotel and off it goes. You drop off. Right there. now on the phone from Manchester, New Hampshire, Don joins us. Welcome, Don. Hi. Um, I'd like to know how we're able to shield our astronauts from the, va the radiation of the Van Allen belt. That, that's a good question. One of the things that the, the fellow that uh, doesn't believe we landed on the moon brings up is uh, how come they didn't get fried? Uh, some people thought you needed a, what, a, a layer of shielding two feet thick. No way, it was not really required, and there was all, all they got was uh, some uh, solar uh, wind uh, interaction with the retina of the eye, and we measured that, and we counted how many of these, and so there is, there is absolutely no danger in that. One of the things that we are told, that there are places that, uh, if there are times when the people in the space station are vulnerable to uh, solar radiation, isn't that a worry sometimes. They themselves would not be, but all of the equipment and all of the, the communications equipment and all of that would be vulnerable. So it is not them themselves, uh, but it is all of the things that they need to, to do and, and the equipment they need to use. It could make your laptop crash, but yes. you're still going to have children. Okay. You still have your fingers. <laughs> okay. What is the, why do we have the misperception about the strength of the, uh, the radiation in the Van Allen belt? It is not a misconception. There is radiation, but... As it, it I mean, there, there's people out there uh, yeah. that it, worry it, about... I, I, I have to jump in here. I'm not afraid of the, the Van Allen belts. I'm afraid of some of these cosmic events that take place on the sun that can send a tremendous amount of energy in our direction. The ejecta uh, from the sun. After the, 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 the solar the, flares. The solar flares. Yeah, if we'd had an astronaut out on the moon when one of those hit, we might have lost one. No and, kidding. Absolutely. It was in Michener's book, Space, and he did his research. Yes, it, it, they can be dangerous. You can be shielded from it. But for those events, we do have to be a little bit cautious. Jeez, just one more thing to worry about. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. And I look forward to, uh, uh, maybe we all meet on Mars one day. <laughs> Count on it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> now, short of a cure, it could be the medical breakthrough diabetics have been waiting for. We talk about how this little device may someday replace...